Hi guys, today we're going to talk about the formal definition of the limit, okay? Um, the reason I want to talk about this is because I've known by experience how difficult it seems to a lot of people. So I, I just want to go through all of it, very detailed as much as possible, okay? So let's start with the first line. It says, let f be a function. Let's stop there. f can be any function okay it doesn't say that f has to be continuous it doesn't say that f has to be differentiable it doesn't say f has to be integrable it says that f is a function okay it could be a constant function piecewise function it could be sine function exponential functions it could be any function okay now we say that and then something happens something appears in front of us this thing so what is this thing? This is just the notation we're going to use for this premise. Okay? So we say that it's just telling you this is the notation I'm going to use for this premise. Whatever the premise is, is the definition of this notation. So I'm going to talk about the notation first. Lim of, and then just lim, L-I-M. Yes, those three letters together is going to be the notation for limit. Yes, it might seem obvious, but sometimes it's not that obvious. And for these videos, I try to be as non-obvious as possible. Unless it's like ridiculously obvious, like zero times zero is zero. But for now, I'm going to throw obvious away and I'm just going to go step by step. So limb, those three letters together are gonna be the representation of the limb, okay? And then it says limb, and below limb, there's an X, there's an arrow, and there's a C. Notice that X arrow C is not on top, it's not on the left, and it's not on the right. It's strictly below those three letters limb. And that's how you're gonna write it always, okay? X arrow C. Now, why did they use arrow? That's going to come. There's a geometric representation of that arrow. Now, um, what I tell my students is that everything in mathematics has a meaning. Okay? So, X arrow C has a meaning. I'm going to talk about it later. But for now, this is how I want you to read it. The limit when X approaches C. Okay? That's how you're going to read it. The limit when X approaches C. That's what those four components together say. Okay? And then there's... Now, before I continue with F of X, C. Let's talk about C. Where is C? C is in the domain of my function. Now, that's very underground, what I just said. It, the truth is, in more advanced mathematics, C is defined as a the limit points of the domain. Forget about what that means. It has a topological representation, but I'm not gonna talk about that. It's too advanced for, for the level I want to go into. Just think about C being in the domain, and that's pretty good for now, okay? Um, so C is in the domain of my function, okay? C is any real number in my domain, okay? And X also, X is a, it's a variable that represents a real number in my domain. Now, the, lim, the limit of x approaches c of f of x. f of x, again, is the same f as we defined. It's a function. But notice where we place lim x approaches c. We didn't place it on top of f of x. We didn't place it on the bottom of f of x. And we didn't place it on the right of f of x. That's very important. Because that tells me, when I read this limit, x approaches c of f of x, that I'm applying the limit to my function. The limit itself is not a function. Limit, the limit is not a function. It's an operation to a function. It's something that you apply to a function. Okay? It's going to produce, by definition, a number. So the limit, when I apply this limit to my function, I'm going to have a number.
And that L is that number. L is a real number, okay? L is gonna be a real number in my codomain or my range, uh, slightly speaking, right? So L is in my range. C is in my domain, okay? That's very important to know. Now, what is the premise? If for every epsilon greater than zero, let's stop there. What is epsilon? Epsilon is a variable. It's a Greek letter. It's a lowercase epsilon, the same epsilon we've heard in fraternities, right? Gamma, epsilon, pi, whatever. So yes, it's a variable that we've used to represent a real number. Epsilon greater than zero. What does that imply? Well, that implies that epsilon is not equal to zero and that epsilon is not equal, I mean, is not less than zero. So epsilon cannot be negative, right? This is what this implied. And epsilon cannot be zero. But it could be any real number greater than zero. It could be pi. It could be square root of two. It could be a billion. It could be a Google zillion, right? It doesn't matter. It's just greater than zero. Now it says for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero. Delta. Delta has the same conditions. Delta cannot be zero, and delta cannot be less than zero. But it's also a real number. Okay? But let's put those two uh, premises together. For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero. What does that imply? That there is a dependence from delta to epsilon. So that's saying, no matter what epsilon I choose, there's always going to be a delta corresponding to that specific epsilon. In some books, in more advanced books, they define delta as a function of epsilon. That would be too complicated to go into, but think about it as being strictly dependent on epsilon. So if I choose an epsilon, let's say, to be 100, then there is a delta, any real number greater than zero, that corresponds to the epsilon being 100. So delta could be 2. But if I choose epsilon to be 100, delta is always 2, because that's the delta that corresponds to that epsilon. If I change my epsilon, let's say 200, then there's another delta that corresponds to 200, say delta 3, equal to 3. So notice the relationship. Every time I change epsilon, my delta is going to change also. It's dependent on epsilon. So that's what that first sentence say. That every time I choose an epsilon greater than 0, a real number greater than 0, there exists another real number greater than 0 corresponding to that, delta, that epsilon. Such that what? What is the condition that has to be satisfied? Now it says, if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c, which is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Okay? That's the premise. That's what changed history. That sentence right there was the most concrete and it is the most concrete definition of epsilon before that we didn't have a definition of epsilon and delta that would correspond to the limit it was in the, it was vague it wasn't it wasn't it didn't exist it people were using these terms as derivatives and integrals without real definition of eps, of the, of limits okay so when Weierstrass came up with this definition, boom, he established limits and we could go on from there. Okay, so that's the definition. Now, let's go by, by parts by parts to break down this definition. So before we even start with the definition, we need to start with what the definition of absolute value is. Now, absolute value <clears throat> of x, just x, is equal, it's a piecewise function, is equal to x for x greater or equal than zero <clears throat> and minus x 
for x less than zero. That's the definition of absolute, absolute value. It's a piecewise function that if x is greater than zero or equal to zero, then it's equal to x. If x is less than zero, then it's equal to minus x. So let's do an example. Absolute value of minus three. Well, minus three, we know that it's less than zero. It's a negative number. So which one are we gonna choose? The bottom one, right? Because it's less than zero. So we have minus minus three by definition of absolute value. So minus minus three gives you gives you what? Three, right? Negative times negative is positive. Now, so the absolute value of minus three is three. Now, what, how about the absolute value of three? Well, by definition, three is greater than zero. So it's just three, right? Because it's the value inside. In this case, it's three. How about the absolute value of zero? Well, it's the top one because zero is included in that inequality. So the absolute value of zero is zero, okay? So we've covered all bases. Notice the, the implications of this. Absolute value is always what? Greater or equal than zero. And that's a property of absolute value. So absolute value of x is greater or equal than zero for all x. So we write for all x, okay? And then I'm gonna use this notation, okay? This symbol is not epsilon, okay? <laughs> I know it's confusing, it looks like epsilon, but it's not epsilon. It's uh, in, so x in the set of real numbers, okay? Sorry, uh, uh, sorry if that might confuse you, but like I said, I'm throwing everything out so it, it lays out correctly. So yeah, x an element of the real numbers. Yeah. So now, what would be this definition? Now, before I land into that, there's another property that I need to use is that if the absolute value of x is equal to zero, if and only if x is equal to zero. Again, it seems pretty obvious, but I'm throwing all the properties out there, so it's not that obvious. So if the absolute value of x is equal to zero, if and only if x is equal to zero, okay? Now, let's take, let's break this absolute value of x minus c. What would that by itself mean? Well, using this definition, the piecewise definition, x minus c is equal by definition x minus c for x minus c greater than or equal than zero, and then minus x minus c for x minus c less than zero, right? It's the same, the same analogy, both top and bottom, okay? The only difference here is that I can manipulate this inequality, x minus c. I can make this equal to x minus c, x greater or equal than c, and then minus x minus c, x less than c, right? I just moved the c to the right. And it represents the same thing. So again, x minus c is positive. It could be equal to zero if x is equal to c, which would be the top one, okay? Now, let's talk about inequalities of absolute values. So let's talk about the absolute value of x being less or equal than some number a, okay? What does that mean? Well, what I'm gonna write is a theorem, but I'm gonna say as a property. Sometimes that happens a lot in mathematics where they seem so obvious that we say they're properties, but, but they're not, you have to prove them. For this one is one of those examples, but again, I'm not gonna prove that, I'm just gonna state what the property is. Absolute value of x being less than or equal than a, if and only if minus a is less than or equal than x, less than or equal than a. Now, if you were to write that as a rep representation in a graph, a graph representation of that inequality, how would it look like? Well, 
I'm sure you've seen this already by now in pre-calc, hopefully. I'll have minus A, I have half A, and then I have bolded circle in both, right, because of the equality. And then the region of X is right here. That's what, that's the graphical representation of what it means to be between minus a and a, being a positive number. So that said, the absolute value of x being less or equal than a is exactly that. That's what it means, is the interval between minus a and a. Now, how do we write this in interval notation? Well, we have bracket a minus a, sorry, a, okay? So all of that 